We are excited for all of our high school and college graduates to make this transition into this next season of life, and we are praying for you. We are with you. And all of us, as we continue to make this transition in the season of life that we're in right now, I think we'd all agree that we are ready for things to get back to normal, whatever normal looks like. In fact, a lot of people have been talking about a new normal. And even though we'd agree that we'd like to go back to normal, I think we'd all agree as well that it would be a waste for us just to go back to normal without learning the lessons that we could have learned or should learn in this season. In other words, like we said last week, pain without gain is just more pain. It's just painful. So from the beginning of this pandemic and this crisis that we've been in, we set as our goal, the goal to not just go through this trial, but to grow stronger through this trial and to come back even stronger for it. And so we said in order to do that, and last week we talked about this, if we're wise, we'll pause. Pause long enough to ask the question, what have I learned and what do I want to carry with me into this next season of life? Or we said this last week, how can I be stronger for it? What should I have been doing or what have I been doing that almost led to my undoing? Or what should we begin doing that we should have been doing all along? Because again, it would be a tragedy for us to waste this moment to learn something and it would be a loss for us just to go on and lose the perspective that we've gained in this moment. So we have this opportunity and, and even though we didn't have the opportunity to choose this pandemic, we do have the opportunity to choose how we will respond, not react, respond to it. And it is our response that gives us the ability to grow stronger for it. In fact, the pandemic and this moment of crisis doesn't have to have the final word our response to it can give us the final word. History is filled with men and women who experience difficulty, hardship, even crisis, similar to or even bigger than what we're going through right now. And what determined the course and became catalytic for them was the choices they made and how they responded in the midst of it. In fact, the history of the church is filled with crisis after crisis after crisis. And crisis never stopped the church and it never stopped the followers of Christ from going on mission into the world. In fact, God often uses crisis in just the opposite way. He uses it to actually catalyze the growth and the progress of the church. He uses it to cause growth in the refining of individual believers, and he uses it to cause the expansion of his mission in the world. And one of the primary reasons why he's able to use it in that way is because of the way the followers of Christ responded in the midst of crisis, in the midst of difficulty, and in the midst of hardship. So here's the way that they responded. You see this over and over in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the midst of crisis and as a response to crisis, they humbled themselves and they desperately sought God. They turned from their sinful ways and turned back to God in a desperate seeking of the presence of God. And so I think, I believe that God uses crisis today in our culture and in our world to bring us back to him, to show us what's really in our hearts and to bring us back to this place where we're desperately seeking him, right? Because it's in the moment of crisis that we realize that the things that we trust in for comfort and security and for love and hope and even for personal change and for guidance, those things are, are insufficient if they're not God. It's in the moment of crisis that we realize how limited our human power is. It's one of the reasons why Jeremiah hundreds, thousands of years ago said, Let not the wise man trust in his wisdom, nor the strong man in his own strength, nor the, the a rich man in his own riches. But let him who boasts, boasts in this, that he knows and that he understands the Lord. We realize how insufficient, how weak our own human power is, and how desperately we need the power of God in our lives. And finally, and I think this is really pertinent, especially to what's been happening in our culture and in our country, now, crisis shows us what's really in our hearts. And it shows our inability to, apart from God, live well. And this last week is, uh, has, has been another tragic and eye-opening moment where we get to see how, how terrible human beings can be to one another. And un unfortunately, uh, again, we get to see uh, an African-American person being disrespected, uh, being killed by law enforcement. And I'm, I'm sure many of you feel this way. I know our country feels this way. It is grieving. It is heartbreaking. It is, um, and I'm not in any way trying to say that I completely understand, but it, it breaks my heart to see people treating each other this way. 
And, and I know oftentimes we hope that laws or policies will remedy the situation, will fix it. And I think that good laws and good policies will help the situation. But those things can never fix the situation because the situation is a problem that doesn't affect just them or us. It affects all of us. The problem is a problem that goes all the way to the root, to the core condition of our own hearts. Our hearts are, are filled with, tainted with, colored with sin. When Adam sinned in the very beginning, he opened the door for sin to come into all of humankind. And with that sin, death, and that death affects all of our lives. And death reigns over our lives. And we see that in the way that people treat each other just because of the color of their skin or because of their, their background. But, but God did something. He sent his son, Jesus. It's the only power that can remedy the situation and fix our hearts. He sent his son, Jesus, who offers us now because of his life and his death and his resurrection. He offers us grace and the gift of righteousness, which is able to diminish and to stay and to remove the stain and effect of sin on our lives. It's the only thing that can really help us. And in these moments, we see that, God, we need, desperately, we need you. So church community and people watching online, I want to invite you to, to pray with me. Pray for our country. Pray, pray for George Floyd's family. Uh, pray for a nation that is struggling with ethnic tension uh, and that can only be fixed by the power and the presence of God. Lord, we, we just, uh, Lord, our hearts are broken. We come to you with humble hearts today. And Lord, we realize that this is not just a problem that's out there. It's a problem that's in here. And so, Lord, we pray for your presence and your power to be with the Floyd family. And, Lord, for those who have lost somebody that they love, and we pray that you would comfort, that you would heal. And, Jesus, I pray that you would be revealed in this moment to them. And, Lord, we pray for those who perpetrated this, this, this unthinkable act. And, Lord, we pray, God, that you would reveal yourself to them. Jesus, we pray that they would come to the knowledge of you, the truth, as their Savior. And Lord, that you would do a miracle in their lives and that you would heal and restore them into relationship with you, O oh God. We pray for that. And Lord, we pray for the healing of our country and for the healing of the ethnic tensions that exist in our country. And Lord, we pray for us that we would be the forerunners, that we would go first and we would say, Lord, deal with us, deal with our heart, Lord. Use us in this situation, but begin with us. Lord, as we repent of our sin, we turn to you and we receive from you what only you can give us, which is a new heart and a new spirit. And Lord, the strength and the power to love you and to love other people as you've created us to do. Lord, we pray for that. We pray for your peace by your spirit and your presence over our country. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So how we choose to respond how you choose to respond to the pandemic, to what's happening in our culture, and our world, that will make all the difference for you and I. We can ignore the moment. We can resist the moment. We can just move through the moment without pausing and waste the opportunity to learn something and to take it into the future with us. Or we can shrink in self-pity. Or what I've been asking us to do, what I'm believing God for us to do, is we can pause. We can pause in this moment and listen to what the Lord is saying. And not only listen to what the Lord is saying, but we can come out of this stronger with a stronger desperation for His presence and a greater reliance on His power. I believe that's what God has for our church. And we can take that into the new normal with us by creating a new rhythm, a new rhythm of listening to the Lord, a new rhythm of pausing, a new rhythm of humbling ourselves, a new rhythm of turning away from the things that come between us and God, turning back to Him, and a new rhythm of desperately seeking Him. And I believe that's what God has for us. And I want to look at that in uh, the early church, in the book of Acts. This is when God is launching His church. Uh, we're going to see how the early followers of Jesus, how they responded to the crisis. Now, think about their crisis. Their leader, Jesus, had just been arrested, uh, not only arrested, but had been tortured through the night and then had been sentenced to death. He was crucified. It was the most disgraceful, undignified, shameful way for somebody to be put to death, uh, not to mention the most painful way for somebody to be put to death. And then Jesus was raised from the dead, and he comes back and he spends 40 days and nights with his followers to teach them, to show them that he's alive. And in the midst of all this, there's turmoil and chaos in Jerusalem as they look for these other followers of Christ. And this is how they respond to the crisis. In Luke 
Uh, we're going to read in Acts. Luke says this, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. So in the book of Acts, this is uh, Luke's second book. There's really two volumes that he wrote, the Gospel of Luke, and then he followed up with the book of Acts. The Gospel of Luke, Luke talks about all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. And then Acts talks about what Jesus continues to do and to teach himself personally and also by his spirit. In fact, the, the book of Acts has been called the Acts of the Apostles because on all the pages, pretty much there's a different apostle. But really the consistent thread through the whole thing is the presence of Jesus and the presence of the Spirit of Jesus. So it would probably be more appropriately titled the, the Acts of Jesus and His Spirit. And so as we read on here, Jesus has just spent 40 days with His followers, teaching them and proving, giving them proof that He's alive. And then in verse 4, chapter 1, it says this, On one occasion, while He was eating with them, He gave them this command. He said, Do not leave. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait but wait, but pause for the gift. And Jesus is speaking about something that is going to come from the Father. But wait for the gift that the Father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. And Jesus had often spoken about the Spirit that would be given. In fact, there was one day where Jesus stood up, which teachers didn't do back then in their day. Teachers were going to teach. They would actually sit down to teach. But Jesus stands up and he cries out, If anybody's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And he says, If anybody believes in me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And this, he was talking about the Spirit who was to be given, for the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. And so this is the gift that Jesus is speaking about that he wants them to wait for. And then he says in verse 5, For John... John baptized you with water, and that word baptism, it means immersed. He immersed you with water, and that baptism was a baptism of repentance. When somebody turned from their sin to God, they would receive water baptism. But Jesus goes on to say, but in a few days, you will be baptized, or you will be immersed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. You will be saturated. Now, I think it's really interesting. Jesus tells him, before you transition from this crisis into what I'm sending you to do, do not leave Jerusalem without this gift. And I think in there, even though it's not speaking about our pandemic, there's, there's, a, there's a caution. Pause. Do not leave this moment to go into the next without being saturated in the presence of God. Look, this is really what we were created for. This is what God has always wanted us to have, is to live in fellowship and relationship with His presence, to be saturated with Him who is the source of life and who gives us the power that we need to live. He created us for this. He created us with this in mind. And so the, the early followers, they knew that the Spirit of God it used to dwell in the tabernacle and it used to dwell in the temple of Solomon. And now God is showing that the temple, the spirit that used to dwell in the tabernacle and in the temple is now going to dwell in you and I, in human temples. It's not just when we go to church. Uh, many years ago, I did a mission trip to Mexico. And as I was talking with one of the little girls there, I asked her, where do you think that God lives? And she pointed to the church on the hill. And I think that's where many of us think. It's when we go to that thing, that's where God lives. But Jesus in this moment is saying, I'm going to do something different. You're becoming the temples of my spirit. This is the way that God always intended for it to be. Our hearts and our lives to be transformed by his spirit and to be empowered so that we could truly love God, love other people, and make the difference that we were created to make. And so throughout the Bible, we see this happening. The Spirit of God empowering people for even specific tasks. We see it happen to this guy named Joseph. God's Spirit gives him the ability to understand and to interpret dreams. We see the Spirit of God empower this man named Bezalel. Bezalel was given wisdom and understanding and even the ability, the creative genius to make beautiful things for the tabernacle. He was our David Croswell creating these things by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God was empowering a group of people who were called prophets to be able to understand from God's perspective, from God's point of view, what was going to happen in the future. And now the Holy Spirit, I think sometimes we miss this, and this is why we, we have such a hard time having a relationship with God, is because we comprehend or think that the Holy Spirit isn't it. It's a, it's a power, it's a disembodied force, but it, it's actually not. The Holy Spirit 
is the presence of God. It's not just an impersonal force. It's not just an it. The Holy Spirit is the person of God. The person of God with whom you and I can have an intimate relationship with. That's what the Holy Spirit is. Because you and I, we can't have a relationship with an it. I have an it that I like very much. This is my iPhone. But this is an it, and you can't have a relationship with an it. I can't talk with it. I talk on it, but it's an it, so I can't talk with it. I don't share my innermost feelings and dreams and desires or concerns. I don't coddle my phone. And some of you are going, well, what's wrong with that? You, you, got a, you got a problem. I may need to disconnect for a little bit. Here's the reality. We can't have a relationship with an it. But the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God. It is God himself that you and I were created to have this intimate friendship with. And so Jesus, we see this through his life over and over. He shows us what it's like to have this intimate friendship with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. Luke, the same guy, tells us in Luke chapter 4, Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. He left the Jordan and he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. He was filled, not with himself, but with the Spirit of God. And he was led, not by his own desires or his own agenda, but by the Spirit of God into the wilderness. And then after that period of time, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. When he begins his ministry, it's in the power of the Spirit, not in his own power. And then he says, he goes into the temple and he says this, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. The Spirit has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. The Spirit has sent me to re proclaim recovery of sight for the blind. And the Spirit has sent me to set the oppressed free. So to offer forgiveness, to actually do physical miracle healings, to open blind eyes and to set people oppressed by spiritual forces and demons. Jesus says it was the Spirit that empowered him and that was anointed, that was on him to be able to do that. And he heals people and he forgives people. And we see the power of the Spirit working through Jesus' life. Everything he does is through the Spirit of God. Everything He does is by the, the Spirit of God. Everything He does is in the power that the Spirit of God gives Him. He was filled. He was guided. He was encouraged. He was strengthened. He was comforted by the Spirit of God. Everything He does, He shows us what it looks like to live in relationship with the Spirit of God. And that is the exact same thing. God wants you and I to be able to have an intimate relationship with His Spirit, with His presence. That's what He desires for you and I. And that's why He tells His followers in this one moment where He's actually getting ready to leave the earth. He's getting ready to go to the cross and to die. And His, his followers, as they begin hearing this, they, they get concerned because Jesus is leaving them. And Jesus tells them this. And, and when you listen to this, maybe you're thinking the same thing I'm thinking. He says this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Maybe you're thinking, like I think when I read that, how could it possibly be to our advantage that Jesus would go away? I mean, I would rather walk with him. I would rather see him do the miracles and touch him and be with him and talk with him. When Jesus walked the earth and he did all these things, it was the Spirit of God that was on him. And Jesus says in this moment, it's actually better for him to go. It's actually better for him to go to the cross and to die and to be resurrected and then to eventually go back to the Father so that he can bring us to God. Not only so that he can bring us to God, but so that you and I could have the gift that he talked about. We could have the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father was going to send. Jesus is with his followers, but he says, it is better for me to be in my followers. Literally, God with you is good, but God in you is even better. You ever think about some of the people that you hope to meet in heaven and just talk to them and ask them about their experience? I mean, I think about people that I'd love to talk to and talk about their relationship with God, how they heard the voice of God and they did such powerful things. And I think those people would rather hear from us what it was like for us to have relationship with God 
where the Holy Spirit was actually living in our lives. I mean, I often think, man, it would be so cool to talk to this guy named David and to talk to this moment where he slays this giant Goliath and to hear about the battles that he won. And I think if I were to go to David and say, David, can you tell me about those things? I'm guessing David might go, hey, hey, wait, wait, wait. I got to know, man, what was it like to have God living in you? I mean, yeah, I was able to do those things by the power of God, but what was it like to have God living inside of you while you were on the earth, leading you, guiding you, giving you power from the inside? What was that like? I think of another guy that I really admire and I love to hear from, Elijah. Elijah, what was it like to call down fire from heaven on that offering? And what was it like to raise that dead boy? And I'm, I'm guessing Elijah might say, you know, yeah, I raised that dead boy by the power of God's spirit, but then he died again. But, but, but tell me, what was it like to have the presence of God dwelling in you? What was it like to be filled with the joy of His Spirit to help you overcome the depression that you faced, to give you power over the sin that was a daily situation? What was that like? Again, one more guy, because I really like this guy named Moses. And I, and I often wonder what it was like to be Moses. Who, he climbed up that mountain to be in the presence of God. And Moses followed the cloud, which was the presence in the fire by night. And I love to say, Moses, what was that like? And I'm guessing again, Moses would go, yeah, you know, I had to climb up that mountain to be in the presence of God. But tell me, what was it like to have the presence of God with you? And we followed the cloud and we followed the fire. But what was it like to have the presence of God with you every single day, guiding you, leading you? showing you when you didn't know where to go or what to do. What was that like? Again, I think Jesus would tell us, like he did tell us, it's to your advantage that I go away. God with you is not as good as God in you. God in you is better. And so in Acts, they gather around Jesus and they ask him the, the question that your kids ask you when you're driving on a trip somewhere. Are we there yet? And they basically say, Lord, is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Are we there yet? And they, they probably had this idea that when the Messiah came, like many had, that it was going to be a military conquest and that Rome was going to be conquered and that all the nations that had opposed Israel were going to be judged and then Israel itself would become the chief of all the nations at the top of the nations again. I think that's what they were thinking. And so Jesus tells them, it's not really for you to know those those things. And he doesn't just dismiss their question, but he tells them and he points them to something greater. He says this, but you, you will receive power. I love that word, that word power. It's the same word from which we get our modern word dynamite. It's the word dunamis. You will receive power on the inside through the Holy Spirit when he comes and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea in Samaria, and even to the farthest parts, even to the ends of the earth. Again, they were expecting one thing, and Jesus didn't just reject their question, but he says, you're going to receive something even better. You're going to receive my power through the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, power to proclaim the gospel in a powerful and effective way, power over sin, power to have victory over the Satan and over every demonic force, power to operate in the ministry gifts and power to do miracles to confirm the message you preach. This is a story about the power and the presence of Jesus leading them by his spirit into all the world to fulfill the mission that he's had from the beginning of time, to fill people with his presence and to send them to spread his presence into the world. Not just a certain group of people, but all the world and all people with his presence. He wants us to be his witnesses, people who are saturated in the presence of God. This is how he designed us. This is how he created us so that we would be completely reliant on his spirit and his presence in, his, in our lives. This is not just what most people think being a Christian is about. Being a Christian, I hear so many times, is about being a good person and I need to change my behavior. And so we work really hard to go at changing our behavior. And honestly, a lot of it just turns out to be external behavior modification. It's kind of cosmetic. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. This is about you receiving the power of God, not to be changed from the outside in, but to be changed, transformed from the inside out. 
God doesn't just modify our behavior. He changes us from the inside out. He changes our mind. He transforms our character. He fills us with the fruit of his presence, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, and self-control. His presence comes inside of us and puts all of those seeds in you and I. He transforms us by his spirit from the inside out. It's the thing that only He can do. It's the thing that you and I so desperately need. We can't change ourselves by ourselves. We can only be transformed by the presence of God as He works on the inside of us. And I've invited my friend Sherry just to come and to share a little bit about how God is doing that work in her life. This is Sherry. Hey, Sherry. Thanks for taking some time with us today. Thanks, Pastor Greg, for having me. As we're just all going through this uh, pandemic time and the stay-at-home order. Um, I'm interested to know what some of the most challenging moments have been for you and also what that's brought up in your life and in your heart. I had a pretty severe panic attack about a year ago while I was driving and the entire right side of my body froze. And at that moment, it was like, I didn't know what I was doing. And oh. that just sent me into uh, just more more panic attacks and fear mm. and so um coming into this pandemic you know that was uh it just really intensified my fear and anxiety even more mm. um and i work for an airline um the the good thing and the blessing was that um i wasn't let go from my job but actually was redeployed uh to another area in hr and um had to really had to learn a new job within um i had one day face-to-face -face interaction with um my new department and then we had wow. to start working from home so you know there were just so many things swirling in my mind i mean learning a new job um just the fear of this COVID 19 in and of itself um was so real for me too i i even had nightmares you know i had mm. a hard time sleeping mm -hmm. um for me, it was just fear of fear of going outside. So, Sherry, as you're navigating through it, how are you choosing to respond to it in a way that you can be stronger for it when we come back? It was really an opportunity for me to press in deeper in my relationship with God. So Whether that meant, you know, just spending more time in prayer, spending more time reading. Um, and just lingering in prayer and worship. And I was so desperate for him to um, give me this peace, you know, to mm. calm the storm within, within my yeah. mind, within my heart. And it was just spending that time with him. And as I did that more and started to hear God's voice even more, um, and that's really what has got me through this, these last two months, you know, just to be able to hear from him and, uh, I love the way that you, you, even that phrase you use, you know, the storm within, because that, that's the, that's the reality for us is that these things are happening on the inside and the temptation is to try and like do things on the outside, hoping to get to the inside. But the thing that gets to the inside is, is the spirit of God. As you're giving God this time and, and, you know, space to speak to you, to lead you, to even get to the inside of you. How have you encountered the presence and the power of God in your own life? You know, God was really speaking to me a lot about this fear. And I, I projected that fear, like even on my relationship with Glenn, my, which is my, was my spouse, my husband. <laughs> yeah. And um, as I would be in prayer, God would just speak to me like, you know, this is what you need to do. You, you need to stop projecting that fear on him and he would just speak to me certain things and guide me in that relationship mm. um because we weren't used to being with each other 24 7 and he's a teacher <laughs> and we're both at home and um you know it was a little challenging at first but you know he would just speak to us and um about how we would navigate in our relationship and so i said okay lord you know and i just take these small little steps of of obeying what he said really at the end of the day and I even saw Glenn you know my husband pressing into his walk in relationship with God and you know we've really been able to um come out on the other side I would say you know in our relationship it's awesome 
Yeah. That's really awesome. So Sherry, what, what practical wisdom uh, would you give? One of the messages it was several weeks ago that you talked about was, you know, whenever we're put in the fire and the crucible, that dross or that those impurities begin to surface in your life. And um, that's definitely been the case for me. I mean, it definitely has revealed so much, so many things that God's brought up in my own life that mm. he's wanting me to deal with, aside from just fear and anxiety. Um, but I think the practical thing we could do is just look at those impurities and, and, and deal with them, you know, ask God for help to be able to overcome those, those things. And whether it's talking to your small group leader, asking them for prayer, um, whether it's going to a transformation weekend, um, for me, what it, what I've done is actually seek, um, professional Christian counseling in this season, um, because of that panic attack that happened last year. And it's been so helpful. Hey, sure. You, you also, you, uh, we, talked before and you mentioned um just a a really cool moment that you and glenn had in just both hearing from the lord can can you share just a little bit about that moment i think that really encouraged some people yeah um you know there was one day when i was just in prayer and i felt the lord um asking pretty bold request of me i'd say um and it was so bold that I was like, well, God, if that's really you, because first I thought it was myself. <laughs> um, can, can you please talk to my husband about it? You know, talk to Glenn about it. Cause he, he needs to hear from you. Cause we, we both need if from in order for me to do this, it has to be the both of us. Mm. And, um, and just kind of left it at that. And then that very night, um, after Glenn was washing dishes, he came up to me and he said, you know, I feel like God wants us to do this and to do this. And right when he said that, I was like, I, I just started, you know, bawling in tears. Cause I was like, wow, God, that, you know, you're so good. And, um, so yeah, you know, we, we followed through with what he had asked us to do. And, um, it's just been so neat, you know, to see things like that. It just builds your faith up to know that, okay, I, God, I am hearing from you. And, you begin to recognize more and more, I think, as you step out and obey him, his voice. You know, I think you talked about the shepherd or the sheep hearing from the shepherd. And um, that's been something really neat for the both of us. And we, um, it's really encouraged us and built up our faith during this season. Sherry, this is, we, we could literally, we could go on for a long time. I got so many more questions for you, but I, I do really appreciate you taking some time and and sharing uh, with some vulnerability and humility and, and honesty, uh, just what God's been doing in your life. It's beautiful. Appreciate it. Thanks, Pastor Greg. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Oh, I really, I really love that. Sherry, thank you so much for just such honesty and vulnerability and showing us how practical the Holy Spirit's presence and power is in our lives. I think a lot of times we get this spiritual sense that makes the Holy Spirit's work different than oftentimes it is. It's very practical in our lives. Uh, I want to finish by reading, today is the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover. They celebrated it in the Old Testament. They celebrated it in the New Testament. And when Jesus came after his resurrection and he told his followers to wait for them, it took on a, a new significance, a new meaning, one that we experience today. And so as we read together in Acts chapter 2, it says this, when the day of Pentecost had come, now because it was this big festival, there were Jewish people from all around the surrounding regions and different ethnicities of Jewish people who were there in the city of Jerusalem. And they were all together in one place. They were all gathered together as we will, thank God, soon be together and are making plans for that right now in one place. And suddenly a sound like a blowing like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. They looked like they were on fire, but they weren't being consumed. That separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, not with an it, but with the presence of God himself. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit was empowering them or enabling them. 
God gives this picture. He wants to make sure that everybody knows that when he's launching his church, he is doing something new. And he comes in wind and fire as a representation. Now, they were really familiar with this because they had seen this before. They had seen it in the tabernacle and in the temple. God would come in his windy, fiery presence and his presence would come in that way. And now God is saying what had been prophesied by the prophets that one day God would come in the new messianic era, but he would come to fill new temples with his presence. And those new temples are us. Our lives become the temples, the building that God wants to fill with this fiery, glorious presence. It's the people of God. And Luke is saying that the new temple that God promised through the prophets is us. It's the people of Jesus. The Holy Spirit gives us His power through His presence, not just to do things or to do something, but to be something, to be His followers, to be lovers of God and lovers of people, to be people that represent Him in the earth. And God baptizes us. He immerses us in His presence to transform our lives. Now, the original followers of Christ when Jesus was arrested and taken away, they were not bold. In fact, they all scattered. They all fled. They were afraid. But something happens after Jesus comes and after the Holy Spirit is given. They become bold, bold witnesses testifying that peace with God is now possible through Jesus Christ. And these people who were cowards and who ran for their life, they became bold. Now, how did that happen? How did somebody like Peter who denied Jesus three times on the day that he was crucified, how did he become such a bold spokesperson who actually stood up at the day of Pentecost that we're reading about and he preached his first sermon to people all from all around the, the region. And at his first sermon, when he got up to proclaim that they had seen Jesus resurrected from the dead, and that this Jesus, who is now alive, he is the one who offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. He has now been raised, and now he offers forgiveness of sins to anybody who repents. He offers freedom from the power of sin and from the power of every demonic force. And he offers you and I rescue from the judgment that's to come. And when he proclaims that with power, 3,000 people believe in Christ in that day, and they give their lives to Christ and surrender. Because this is why, because they were filled with the presence and the power of God. God gave them his presence to preach the word of God powerfully, to preach the gospel powerfully. And God gave them his power to work signs and wonders or miracles to confirm the message that he preached. And that's the same thing that he wants to do in our lives through his presence and through his spirit. You know, I think one of the challenges of understanding how the Spirit works is because oftentimes, again, we think it's so spiritual and we consider it such an ethereal thing and, it, and oftentimes it's a practical thing. So let me just read to you a couple of things that I've experienced and have heard through the years that the Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit has done. I've heard people say, I finally forgave my dad by the power of the Holy Spirit. I heard somebody say, I finally lost 150 pounds and quit smoking that I've always wanted to do. By the power of the Spirit, I've forgiven my ex-husband for his infidelity. By the power of the Spirit, we have adopted two children from Russia. We couldn't make it happen, but somehow God opened that door. By the power of the Spirit, I'm able to see myself as God sees me rather than the names I've always carried. I have faith to tithe and have given more than I could ever have imagined. I have the strength to endure a series of cancer treatments. I've overcome a drug addiction, alcohol addiction, gambling addiction, sex addiction, pornography addiction, and even a shopping addiction. I've heard all of that. I've overcome an eating disorder. I am 15 years clean and sober by the power that God's Spirit supplies to my life. By the power of God's Spirit, we were told we would never be able to conceive, and we conceived, and we had a baby. By the power of the Spirit, my children returned home after years of non-communication. By the power of Spirit, I found peace when my wife passed away and I, thought like, I felt like my life was over. By the power of the Spirit, my, I remarried my ex and after being, divorced for seven, after being divorced for seven years. I have a conviction that we're all sinners and there's, there will be a judgment that Jesus alone can save us, forgive us, and bring us relationship with God and that He alone is the lasting source of hope by the power of the Spirit. 
and by the power of the Spirit, like Peter, like the apostles, I'm different. I have a boldness that I know is not me to share what God has done in my life with my friends. And by the power of the Spirit, this is exciting, I've led my coworkers, my friends, into a relationship with Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is a supernatural friend. His power wants to transform us and make us stronger on the inside. As we do this, as we surrender, as we surrender our lives and begin to desperately seek His presence in our lives. In fact, if there's an area of your life where you don't feel like you're able to change or be transformed, perhaps that's an area where the Holy Spirit has not yet been invited in. So let me ask you as we, we finish this time together and we go into a time of communion, time of receiving the Lord's Supper, is there an area of your life where maybe the Holy Spirit, especially in this moment or through this time of COVID-19, where the Holy Spirit has been trying to speak to you? Maybe there's an area of your life where God wants to come and by His Spirit transform, strengthen you and cause you to do what you cannot do on your own. Have you invited Him into that area? Would you be willing to surrender to your Heavenly Father who loves you and who through Jesus Christ promised that He would give you the gift of the Holy Spirit to transform you, to strengthen you, and to cause you, no matter what the circumstances are, to be stronger for them because of His Spirit. Thank you for joining our Grace Honolulu YouTube channel. If you haven't yet subscribed, please subscribe to it so that you can keep track with all the sermons that are coming out. As well, you can follow us on social media and download our Grace Honolulu app to stay connected. Uh, as well, if you'd like to give, you can always give at our website, gracehonolulu.org. Thanks for watching. Have a great week. God bless you.